Yeah, no, that said that to me was from Ontario. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's. Um, I want to start um, by painting a big picture. Yeah. Here. Um, just uh, the the whole question. Like a lot of uh, this will be shown at universities and things. So many of the students don't have a sense of that era. That's right, they so don't. I, so I would paint me a picture of, of Canada in 1981, the, the tensions that were there. Yeah. The, what was the country like? Well, I was first elected in 1967 to the legislature, but 78 as the premier. So I can go back to the kind of beginnings of this situation with the constitutional fracas back to the 70s and the 71 uh, Victoria uh, meetings which ended in failure. But you know through the 70s was a tumultuous time in Canada, there's no question about that, and uh, culminating in 1980 with the, uh, with the referendum in Quebec um, where the promises were made to the people of Quebec that they would be brought into confederation and Mr. Trudeau made that promise, as did the premiers uh, of the day too. But it was a tumultuous time in Canada, there's no question about that, with the prior with the FLQ problems in Quebec and that type of thing. So starting in the 1981, um, we were all hopeful that a lot of this might be behind us and behind Canada and we were looking to a new era with uh, getting the Constitution back home, patriated as, patriated as they called. I don't know where that word came from, but it was to bring it back to Canada so we could do all our own laws and change our, uh, uh, our so-called Constitution. And we all started out um, hopeful that uh, there would be no bitterness, but unfortunately it didn't work out that way. And uh, so it's an era that maybe a lot of people don't understand in Canadian constitutional history, and they should understand it, because I think it was, it was a turning point in 1981 when we finally did bring our constitution back to Canada from Westminster, and a lot of people don't understand why it was ever over there, but it was a British Act in 1867. And um, after that, we believe that uh, everything would settle down in this country, which it didn't, unfortunately. And through the, through the 80s, we then went through the Meech Lake Accord, which I participated in. And uh, then we went through the Char Charlottetown Accord. And uh, so there's still a gap that's got to be filled to bring Quebec into full uh, membership in the constitutional life of this country. And it will happen, but probably not in my time. When you traveled from Nova Scotia to Ottawa um, for those four days, were you hopeful that Quebec could be convinced? Uh, was, 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 did you go with that hope? Yes, I did. And, uh, you know, um, we, had, we had met before that uh, in a conference in 79 um, and um, at that time began the process uh, and then the premiers of course had met in our own premiers conference to get ready for what we knew would be conferences in 1980 and 81 but primarily 81 when we uh, had to go in 81 because prior to that the some of the provinces had gotten together under the <laughs> under the title the Gang of Eight, uh, which I was a member. We weren't a member right away, by the way. Six provinces were, and I hope I'm not wrong. I think Saskatchewan, Alan Blakeney, and myself were kind of the odd men out. We were not part of the Gang of Eight right away, and it took us a little while. And the reason we did take a while, I wanted to consult with people home. I wanted to consult not with the people generally, but with my own cabinet and with my attorney general and my deputy attorney general and those people before we decided, yes, we we would break away and join this so-called Gang of Eight and so did Alan Blakeney also. And so going into 81 after the Supreme Court had made its decision that uh, 
the federal government had a legal right to patriate unilaterally, but under our system of government since 1867 with conventions, so-called conventions, which simply means provinces getting together with the federal government to look after the details of, of changes in the country, uh, that it would be very important that those conventions be upheld and that there be um, not a majority of the provinces, but a good number of the provinces would be involved in a consensus if there was a repatriation and a change in the Constitution of Canada. And so when that happened, then the 1981 conference began. Now, I really believed when we started in 1981 in, I guess it was the 2nd of November, I, I really believed that we would be able to accomplish it this time. And I really sincerely believed that uh, Quebec would come in with the others. They were actually, Mr. Levesque, who I like very much personally, by the way, um, that Mr. Levesque, had, was a member of the so-called Gang of Eight, and uh, I always believed that he really wanted to, that he really wanted to be part of the consensus in getting the Constitution back and uh, and to amending the Constitution. The Charter Rights was something else; it hadn't really come to the fore at that point, but we knew it was coming. Of course, there's no question about that. But I really, I, w I was one of the ones who was really optimistic, and I think many of them were very optimistic that we would end within three or four days with a, uh, not just a consensus, but a, unan a unanimous decision to proceed forward. At what point did you sense that there might be real problems um, where uh, your, your hopes looked like they would not bear come to pass? I think it happened after the first day. Um, we had met privately for a t period of time and then in the, in the full session. And uh, I remember my Attorney General, Harry Howe, an incredible uh, lawyer in Nova Scotia, and an Attorney General, and then he, uh, I appointed him as a, uh, uh, as a uh, provincial court judge and then the chief judge. He was an extraordinary man. I remember we met that night after the first meeting and uh, I asked him, I said, how do you think we're going ahead, fellas? And Harry said, I, I think we're going to have problems tomorrow or the next day. <laughs> Maybe he could see something I couldn't see, but, and he was right, there, there were problems developing. But, you know, um, in the second and third days, uh, there seemed to be a consensus developing among the premiers with our, uh, you know, God bless the people who are with us, uh, our so-called uh, uh, people who are constitutional experts. Although somebody told me once the constitutional expert is just somebody from out of town, but there were some extraordinary people working with us, no doubt about that. But it was quite evident that we were, we were going to have some difficulties putting it all together. And the difficulties, of course, started uh, to be um, incredibly uh, difficult in the third day. Uh, with the Quebec group, uh, Mr. Levesque and uh, Mr. Morin and Mr. Parizeau, who it appeared they were going to be very difficult to have a finality in this. Tell me a little bit more about Mr. Levesque. What, what mm -hmm. made him tick? Well, there are many people who don't, don't agree with what I'm going to say, but I liked Randy Levesque. I really liked him. Um, I remember the, uh, the New England governors and the Atlantic Premiers meeting in 1979, and we met in Quebec. And when we arrived for the opening reception, we were all in a huge room at the hotel up on the Richelieu River, and everyone was looking around saying, where is the Premier Minister? Where is Mr. Levesque? He wasn't there. And a group was over by a window, and we were looking out the window, and suddenly looked down, and there was René Levesque greeting the workers at the hotel who were going off shift and greeting the ones who were coming on shift. He was down there for at least 20 minutes. I said to myself, you know what? What's more important to him than what's going on in this room is making sure that he meets all those people who are going to work and, and, uh, and uh, leaving work. And that was true. He, he, had a, he had a kind of a unique, interesting personality. Uh, one other thing, a little story about him. Uh, 
I had the great honor of being uh, the, an honorary pallbearer at John Diefenbaker's funeral. He and I were very close over the years. And uh, before he passed on, he made his list of honorary pallbearers and pallbearers, and that was the way he operated. And uh, of all the Canadian premiers, he had my name down because we were very close, and he could have had other, there were other four other Tory premiers. I had only been premier for a little over a year and a half. So we were in Ottawa, and the honorary pallbearers were on both sides of the casket when it was taken into the church. And Mr. Levesque was late, which was not unusual. I'm late a lot myself, but he was late. And he, I could see him coming up on the side of the church, and cigarette in hand. That was his trademark, cigarette in his hand. And he looked over and saw me, oh, hello, hello. And he came over and he stood next to me. And I didn't want to tell him, hey, you know, I don't think you should be here. You should be in the church. I didn't say a word until the senior usher, who was waiting for him in the steps of the church, saw him and came over and spoke in French to him. And, and then he looked at me and he looked at him and he said, what about him? And the usher said, oh, uh, Mr. Levesque is wondering why you're out here. And I told him that the other premiers are inside, and he's to go inside and sit with them, and I'm taking him in. And uh, so Levesque looked at me, and he looked at him again, and he said, but what about him? And the usher said, well, he's the uh, an honorary pallbearer, and I can still see Rennie, that little smile on his face. And he took a puff out of his cigarette, put it down, and he looked at me, and he went like this. <laughs> Big shot, eh? And he walked inside. But that's, that's what he was like, a great personality. I liked him very much. Now, having said that, uh, there's no question that he and his group decided on the, I think, the night before the last day, I think they decided they were not going to go through with this. And, of course, the end result was that when we all agreed, uh, that is, the nine agreed and Mr. Trudeau agreed, and he disagreed, and the delegation got up and walked out. It's one of those moments you'll never forget in politics. Yeah, that must have been a sinking feeling. Yeah, it was, because um, I kind of thought, well, this is the end of it. But it wasn't, because the Supreme Court had made it very clear, as long as there was a, a requirement that a consensus among the premiers was there, uh, it could be patriated and we could amend the Constitution without Quebec. But it was rather sad that it happened that way. And it was sad in, in Meech Lake. I was there for that, too. And... That was sad. The, uh, when we all agreed, we all signed, initialed everything. And uh, a lot of people thought that that three-year business, uh, that you had to have this fully done and, and the nine, ten legislatures in the federal government had to agree three years after the first government had passed a resolution in their, in their house that it had to be done, and if it wasn't, it would all die. Well, it died. But a lot of people thought, we had put that provision in the Meech Lake Accord. It wasn't in the Meech Lake Accord. It was in the 1981 Accord. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. How about uh, Mr. Levesque and Mr. Lougheed? Um, were, did they see eye to eye? You'd have to ask Premier Lougheed that question. Um, at times, I thought they did. And at times, I thought that... Uh, Peter, Peter Lahey, a very outstanding man, by the way, half Nova Scotian, and that's why he's outstanding. His mother was from Halifax, Dartmouth. Um, but I think that Peter Lahey liked Randy Levesque, my opinion, and I think Randy Levesque liked him. And I think they, uh, they had an understanding that they both uh, had good minds at politics and government and constitutional law. Uh, but the end result was that, of course, the, it all did fail. Yeah. And I, I, I guess they had Mr. Trudeau in common as well. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes, he was always there. <laughs> he liked to, he liked to say in boxing, jab and punch, and jab and punch, and he, he did a lot of jabbing and <laughs> took a lot of punches, but um, there were times when he would make some remarks that would just infuriate René Levesque, of course, and and upset uh, some of the other premiers, particularly uh, Premier Lyons, and he uh, didn't see eye to eye all the time. <laughs> but, but in the end, I, I really think that, that um, all of the premiers and the prime minister, we, we get along very well. In, in our private sessions, we get along very well. 
Tell me a little bit more of, of um, your reading of Mr. Trudeau. Why was the Constitution uh, coming back to Canada so important to you? Well, I think it was important to all of us. And um, if you historically go over this, you'll see that there were attempts made back in the 20s and 30s to patriot the Constitution or ensure, and of course a lot of this happened of course over the years that the British Parliament weren't able to make laws respecting Canada after 1931 I think and after 1949 uh, the um, uh, Westminster was not able to be the final decision maker with courts, the Supreme Court of Canada took over then from the House of Lords in London so it, it was always happening in pieces, bits and pieces over the years. Um, so it was inevitable that we were, the country had grown up. I mean, we were a sovereign nation almost. And so the last bit of this would be, of course, to ensure that we could amend our own so-called, we never had a constitution in this country. The BNA Act was not a constitution. It was an act of the uh, Parliament of Westminster and um, so we needed a constitution. The United States has a constitution. All sovereign countries have constitutions. So it was important that we have our own constitution and that we've been able to amend our own constitution. So attempts have been made through, as they say, going back to the 30s, but primarily into the 70s and 80s when we achieved it. Is <coughs> that kind of balancing act I guess you could call it, between a country of strong regions um, and yet a country that aspires to be a country. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, the Canadian, um, I wouldn't want to say the Canadian dilemma, but mm -hmm. maybe the, Canadi the strength of who we are as Canadians? The strength of who we are as Canadians is number one, we are number one Canadians. Uh, number two, we have our own regions. That's an interesting concept of Canada too, you know, because we have, uh, we have the western region, we have the Pacific region, the central region, the Maritimes, and the, uh, and the Atlantic region. Some people say, what do you mean by that, uh, Maritimes? Well, Newfoundland has never agreed since the days of Smallwood that they were part of the Maritime provinces. They agreed they'd be part of the Atlantic provinces as a region, not the Maritimes. And of course you go west, the western provinces are western province. BC doesn't consider itself a region of Canada as a western province, it's a Pacific province. But that, that's, you know, that's kind of unique to Canada, but it also indicates the Canadianism of us all, that we do have our regional differences. Uh, we're different in the Maritimes or Atlantic Canada than you are out here in western Canada. Although I think, if, I, if I'm reading this correctly, most of the people in Western Canada came from the Atlantic region anyway, and they're here. Um, but it, it, it makes for a difference in our country, much different than Australia, by the way, much different than this New Zealand, much different than the other Commonwealth countries where we do have this regional breakup. And uh, so it's healthy for us to get together as provincial premiers from time to time to work out our differences and to try to uh, bring our country as to, you know, together as one big country with these, with these various regions and the, the ten provinces. And I guess uh, maybe the initiative for that is a more natural initiative among the premiers than a prime minister. In a oh yes. That, that oh, I, I, Trudeau's I, I agree with that. Um, I think Mr. Trudeau, um, Mr. Trudeau in 1980, as you may, he made that comeback uh, with the short-lived Joe Clark government and um, uh, Alan J. McEachern, who I have a lot of time for uh, from Nova Scotia, who's a dear friend of mine, always took credit for making sure that Trudeau ran again in the 1980 election. He was right. He, he was quite positive that Trudeau would make a comeback and win again. But I think that Trudeau, when that happened, that Pierre Trudeau wanted to make sure, and he, I think he knew that he would sit for one more term and uh, that would be it. 
Uh, but I think he wanted to make sure that by the time he left, that the Constitution of Canada or the BNA Act and the Apatriation was back here and we could amend it ourselves. It was an aim that he had, it was a, it was a dream of his, and, and it worked out for him. Watch I don't think it was as much a dream for all the premiers as it was for him. And he was the Prime Minister and he wanted this to happen and I think all of us decided that it was time. This was the time to do it and uh, let's get it done. Watching him over those four days, um, was it a real roller coaster ride for him? I mean, do you, do you think he was confident he was going to get a deal or was he not confident? <laughs> I don't know. That's an interesting question. I think he enjoyed it all. I really do. I think he enjoyed the so-called roller coasters, you call it. I really do. I think he enjoyed it. And um, there were times, I think, when he was frustrated. There's no question about that. And there were times when then the premiers were all frustrated. But in the end result, I think we saw the goalpost there and we figured we could cross it. And we did. Hmm. Thank you, sir. You're quite welcome. That's awesome. <laughs> really wonderful to have the chance to talk. Thank you. It's, um, all this before we get... <laughs> I'll leave this board with you. <coughs> That politicians, we always say when it's true, they say, oh, that's good. And then we say, oh, I wonder if he's got it. I wonder if he's thought of this. And then he says, oh, look, one other thing. <laughs> it's like Columbo. Did you ever watch that movie, Columbo, the old Columbo movies? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When he'd be heading out the door and he'd say goodbye and he'd get the door open. The door. One other thing. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Um, yeah, let, let's talk a little bit about Bill Davis. Yes. Um, how would you describe his role? Oh, extraordinary. No question about it. Extraordinary. Uh, deep thinking individual, very personable, uh, very likable. I've always liked Bill Davis and uh, I sat next to him at every federal provincial conference that he was, well I was, well, I was premier for 13 years and he, he was uh, premier from uh, 70 right to 84 and I sat with him next door, next to him uh, from 78 right up to 84. Always enjoyed being with him. Always enjoyed being with him. Uh, you'll still see him sitting there smoking that pipe. Uh, trademark, Randy Levesque cigarette. Trademark, Bill Davis, the pipe. No, I always enjoyed Bill Davis. Uh, great personality, uh, deep thinking individual who contributed an awful lot to the Constitutional Conference. No question about that. <clears throat> In fact, um, when we had put together a proposal, the so-called Gang of Eight, and uh, we were asked, uh, th then a group of us uh, decided, they, the group decided to ask myself and uh, Premier Angus McLean and Alan Blakeney if we would take this to Mr. Trudeau to see what he thought about it, whether he would accept it, reject it outright, or accept parts of it. In the end, he rejected the whole thing. But then we decided, look, you know, it might be better if we had an intermediate there too, because Bill Davis was not part of the Gang of Eight. And so uh, he was asked if he would go with us uh, to meet with Trudeau, not as a member of the Gang of Eight, but as an intermediary, and he did. And uh, he, he attempted to have our, our what we had put proposal before Trudeau, but he rejected it. But no, Bill Davis, he, uh, he contributed a lot. I always look to Bill Davis and Peter Lougheed a lot uh, in, the, in these constitutional conferences. When, when you got to Ottawa um, in, the, in that, that November, was Bill Davis still sort of a man in the middle? Was he trying to, to effect a compromise? Oh yes, oh yes, he definitely was. Uh, as you know, I hope I got these dates right, in, I, I, in the uh, 81, uh, in 80, the Gang of Eight had gotten together, and he wasn't part of it, neither was my friend Richard Hatfield. Uh, but he was always there, willing to talk to us, uh, if we wanted him to. Because he, wa he just that he, he didn't, he passed on in April, so. Yeah. No great shame. Yep, yep, great shame. yep. Great shame. Thank you. Thank you. By the way, just a side, 
He was born in Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. <laughs> and he graduated from Bridgewater High School. Yeah. And he graduated from Dalhousie Law School two years before I did. Mm -hmm. I used to open the conferences with saying, I'm so pleased to be with my fellow Nova Scotian, Alan Blakeney, whose father, whose brother, by the way, uh, still lives in Bridgewater, as you know, Alan. Your two sisters are in the Annapolis Valley, and they still all vote Tory. And <laughs> he would always say, ah, ah. I came west and saw the light. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I think we, we were just talking Bill about Bill Davis and Hatfield and, and in a sense, whether they were a bridge, if you like. Uh, uh, Bill Davis was a bridge, no doubt about it. Bill Davis was there uh, to help any time he could. As I said, when he, we went to meet with Mr. Trudeau, he came with the group of three of us. Um, he always was there to help, can I put it that way, as was, as was uh, Dick Hatfield, but more so Bill Davis. The, um, just one last thing, the, um, yeah, if, if, if you were to describe the legacy for Canada of bringing the Constitution home and, and those negotiations, um, how would you describe that? Like land, I describe it as a landmark decision for Canada, I really do. It, it, it ensured that Canada was always a sovereign country, but it absolutely ensured that we were now a sovereign country on our own. And the apron strings had been severed from Britain, except for the monarchy, which I hope will always be there. Marvelous. Okay. Thank you, sir. <laughs> the Queen will like me saying that last bit. <laughs>